Hello everyone, bring you a video today looking at some Great War reenacting kit. Now I'm off to an event, a private reenacting event, um, recreating a, a platoon of the 2nd Battalion of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, circa late 1916, and we'll be occupying a recreated section of trench and we'll be living as closely as possible uh, to how, how soldiers did at the time, obviously within the limits which are obviously set upon any kind of reenacting scenario like that. We will be using live rifles with blank ammunition, which is something of a rarity for me. I don't tend to get involved in that side of reenacting very much, but that'll be a nice change from the normal pace of things. Obviously living with primarily uh, period small kit, uh, taking all that with us, obviously wearing the web equipment and detailed off to do fatigues and wiring parties and things like that, as would have been at the time. That's the intention anyway, and we I think we're rotating through a frontline section of trench, so we'll, we'll see how it goes anyway. I'm very much looking forward to it. I won't be able to film at the event proper, because obviously it's supposed to be somewhat immersive, so phones, technology, cameras in the uh, in the, the trench itself uh, is, is, is not permitted, and as such I won't be filming at the event itself. But nevertheless, I thought it'd be interesting to run through the kit I'm taking with me, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the event when I get back and, and after I've experienced it, which will be tagged on to the end of the video. But without further ado, we'll get into the main part, looking at the kit I'm taking with me. So the basic uniform is, of course, service dress, which you can see here. And this is badged up according to the role I've been given, which is Lance Corporal in one section, with the other insignia I've been instructed to include, which is the Good Conduct Stripes and the Wound Badge down on the left cuff there, which you can see. There's also a pair of... This is a, a 1960s jacket it's, it's a real one but obviously somewhat different from, from great war in the details the line collar and the the single dart at the at the collar as well but for our purposes it, it serves the role i will be getting a reproduction hopefully of a, a great war era service dress jacket at some point but unfortunately to covid and so forth i was going to go to uh to uh, richard knight for that but uh, he's had trouble getting the the cloth i borrowed a set of his reproduction trousers to wear you can see the matching the cloth there, the surge is very, very good. So hopefully I'll be able to procure more of that and I'll get a suit of the of Great War service dress from him at some point going forward. Reproduction soft cap at the top there, as you can see, with the, the appropriate badge for the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. There are some pocket contents here as well to look at. Uh, I've said I have this basically loaded as it will be during the event, so have a quick look at the pocket contents as well. So in the top right breast pocket as it's worn, we have a... Uh, Copy of the Gospel according to St. John, uh, which I've included in there. Act of Service of the Paybook, the AB64. It's a reproduction from the Funk Hole. So, a notebook and a pencil. Over in the other Breast pocket, in the left breast pocket, we have a box of Swan Vesta matches. These are the modern box which I've recovered with a period label and a shaving mirror in cover. Steel shaving mirror in cover there, as you can see. And then in the lower pockets, we have a pair of gloves in, the, in their respective pockets, a couple of handkerchiefs and a clasp knife, a period clasp knife, which will be a useful thing to have. So that's the, the basic uniform with the various pocket contents as I'm planning to have them. And we'll move on now, we'll have a look at the, the undergarments and other bits of clothing before moving on to look at the web equipment. One pocket content I almost forgot to mention is the first field dressing down in the skirts of the jacket here. You can see a specific dressing pocket worked into the skirts here. I have a reproduction Great War first field dressing in there. So the other items of clothing and sort of items I'm wearing, we have obviously a set of White cotton brace at the top there, they are original, uh, set and war dated, uh, rather worn, they've been repaired, so I'm happy to use those, they're my using set, appropriate for the time period as well. Woolen drawers, not entirely sure whether I'm going to go this far and wear uh, these reproductions of Great War woolen underwear, uh, the short type, uh, they were also made in a longer variety as well. These were made for me again by Dickie Knight, who I'm hoping will be able to, uh, to make me a set of service dress at some point. But anyway, I probably will wear those. I think I'm going to go that far and actually wear reproduction period underwear. And then a set of grey woolen socks in the centre there. And the grey back shirt, of course. Standard fare for the time, really. And then we have in the middle here a set of ID discs. The green and red ID discs, which was a relatively new development at this time. The 
time period we're recreating. And then a watch with a trench guard, a wrist watch. Now wrist watches were not as common amongst the other ranks as they were amongst officers, but there's an interesting thread on the Great War Forum. Uh, if you search wrist watch on there, certainly they were used, just not as commonly as say pocket watches. So I'm including that there, as I say, provided not everyone, everyone else has one in our section or, or in the platoon as a whole. I think one NCO having one is, is not unrealistic. Uh, certainly there is evidence that privates and NCOs did use wristwatches, but perhaps not as much as pocket watches. But for convenience sake, and as I say, it is not historically inaccurate for an NCO to have one. I've got that uh, wristwatch there with the trench guard on it. So it's a, an Eagle Moss reproduction. It's one of the cheap ones that came out with a series of magazines a few years ago. Uh, so the face and everything does look quite appropriate. I'll bring up the camera here so we can have a look. Uh, the face and everything does look quite appropriate in there. The numerals are of the, of the, of the period and the trench guard I added on myself and, and the strap and everything. So it, it looks appropriate. And as I say, it's not a historical for an NCO to have a, a wristwatch as opposed to a pocket watch. So I'm taking that with me as well. The boots I'm using are B5s. These are from Soldier of Fortune. I've not had a problem with them in the time I've used them. Just given these a good coat of dubbing. Uh, the soles I've had re rehobbed and the heels done and a reproduction end plate fitted and the, the toe plate, the, the common toe plate used during the Great War was this shape and you can see why it's called an end plate. This was done by a friend of mine called uh, Tim Kearney who had some reproduction end plates to fit so they've been fitted and they certainly add something to the boots. Soldier of Fortune's boots obviously relatively cheap uh, to buy compared to Lennon's and others. The quality is not as good obviously but I've not had a problem with them for the use I've put them through and I have the putties tucked away in each one. If you use your putties on the same leg all the time, they mould to the leg somewhat and they're easier to wrap neatly. So I carry them, when I, when I unwrap them, I left and right, uh, I store them in the boots. Uh, easiest way of, of knowing uh, which way, could, of course you can mark them up as well. I may well stitch little L and little R into these at some point with some embroidery thread to mark them. I just haven't got around to doing that. So in the meantime, the easiest way of differentiating them is to just keep them inside the respective boots as we have here. So that's the footwear. Another piece of clothing I'm taking with, which we'll mention here, is a leather jerkin. This particular example is very possibly civilian. I picked this up a while ago. I can't remember where from now. Uh, it doesn't appear to be a military example. It has a, a green wool lining, uh, which is somewhat different from, from what you'd expect. Certainly in the Great War, it'd be more common to find grey. That seems to be the, the sort of standard lining colour. Uh, but I fitted it with leather buttons based on my original Great War jerkin, which I have, which had one original button left. I replaced the missing buttons on that with the exact the same as the ones I've used on here. So outwardly, at least, it looks appropriate for the period. And if it rains and so forth this weekend, which it isn't supposed to, but if it does, it'll be good to have this along. It's supposed to be relatively mild, so I may well end up not using this at all, but it'll be a good thing to have along with me in case. So a leather jerkin. We'll talk now about the web equipment I'm taking with me. And this is a basic set of 1908 pattern web equipment. I am also taking the pack and the haversack, but they're detached at the moment for transport. The equipment is a mix of original and reproduction components. The belt is original, as are the two braces. The cartridge carriers are from Soldier of Fortune, uh, as is the bayonet frog. The health carrier is from Military History Workshop. And the head carrier for the entrenching tool and the water bottle carrier are reproductions of unknown origin, but they seem to have been made up using original components, which is, is good. They blend in with original equipment quite nicely. The cartridge carriers are pretty much empty, as you can see. They just contain empty charges at the moment, ready for loading with ammunition. We're getting a basic load of 70 rounds, issued more, we can purchase more rounds should we wish to. So that's the basic setup as we have it here, obviously with the bayonet and the health of the entrenching tool and the carrier on this side. We do have a head in the entrenching tool carrier there and the water bottle over on the far side there, the enamel water bottle and its felt cover in the carrier there. So that's the basic web equipment. Obviously ammunition will be added once we're on site and once ammunition has been issued. So what we have here are the pack and then top right we have the haversack and below that the respirator haversack which of course contains the PH type respirator, hood type respirator that is. This has been looked at previously on the channel. Uh, it's carried inside in a waterproof wallet as you can see there. There's a waterproof wallet inside this cotton haversack. I've looked at that in, in previous videos in detail. Won't look at that now. We will look at the contents of the haversack and the pack however in turn. So looking at the haversack first of all, it's unbuckled. This is an earlier pattern of haversack which retains the fittings 
on the front here with this loop and the buckle just to the rear there, which allowed the early water bottle carrier to be strapped onto the haversack when carried on the back. So being a Lance Corporal who has the good conduct badges I've been told to sew on, uh, it means I've been serving for a while, so it would make sense for me to have at least part of my web equipment be of the earlier pattern. So we've got that here with the earlier pattern of haversack. Inside here, this is not perhaps typical of every operation, but basically as per instructions and what we're going to be carrying with us. We've got the, a spare pair of socks in there, a hussif, which would normally be carried in the pack, along with the, the hold all, which again would normally be carried in the pack. The plan is for us to go up the line and then uh, transfer over from marching order to uh, battle order, which means moving the haversack to the back and therefore carrying a, a bit more in the haversack than would be typical. Inside the hold all, of course, we have the, the usual sort of contents in here, um, shaving brush. I do have a straight razor here, which is a bit of a cheat. It's one of the cartridge type. I'm not even sure I'm going to use that because I've not practiced in using a straight razor. But I have had a go recently. I'm not sure I'm practiced enough for it to be a good idea. If I end up cutting myself badly, uh, it could be an issue for the event. So I might well swap over to a safety razor. We'll see. A uh, little bar of soap in wax paper there, pear soap, which was of course around at the time. The IDL uh, tooth powder tin, which I've actually put some Eucryl tooth powder in, so that will be used. A reproduction brush for use, obviously going to be brushing my teeth with that, and a bone comb there. And of course spare boot laces, which can be very useful. So that is the hold all. Let's pop that to one side for the minute. And then again, it's going to be quite mild, but I'm not skimping on uh, the woolens. We've got a, a balaclava here basically something that would have been knitted at home and sent out the previous winter perhaps. A scarf, again, they pack down nice and small in here so there's not much extra weight or anything to carry and they act as a nice padding to your back as well. So cutlery as well, obviously knife, fork and spoon there. So they're stowed separately to the, to the hold all, make them more accessible. A honeycomb towel there. And then something we've been instructed to take is a bundle of four candles. I got a pack of five, so I've wrapped those up and tied them up in some grease proof there. So a pack of five candles in there. All fits quite ne neatly down in the in the haversack. So there it is. That's the haversack contents. So we have the pack here, as said, and we have the helmet on the outside to start with and, and the mess tins. I'll get this unstrapped so we can have a look at what is in here. Get this unbuckled at the back here. So using the supporting straps to help carry that external load, which became very common later in the war as uh, the soldiers' load increased. So this is a, just pull this back in here. This is a, uh, a Belgian helmet uh, with the rim removed and fitted, obviously riveted in a military history workshop liner, Mark I liner, but without it having the rim, obviously it's an early shell. So a Brodie type B with a Mark I liner fitted to it, basically. Uh, very appropriate for the time period. So, steel helmet there. The mess tins, of course, as well, which are carried underneath. So these are pro these will probably need repacking when I get there to carry, possibly carry bits and pieces in that that I'm issued. Uh, but what we have in here at the moment um, is the the tin mug we've been told to bring, and inside I have an improvised stove, which is made from a little tin. So this is a Marifat Peas tin from Morrison's. Uh, it's the same size as those issued in later ration packs. So uh, the uh, ration packs which were issued through into the 1990s before Boil in the Bag came in. Uh, these are exactly the same size as the tins used in there. In a Great War context, this sort of tin would poss possibly have been used to issue out uh, beans, particularly 1916. There was a shortage of meat stuff, so beans were quite commonly issued or processed cheese. In a smaller tin like this. Inside, in place of period solid fuel, which did exist in things like Kempite and, and Tommy's Trench Fires, I'm using Hexi. So that's packed in there, you can fit three blocks in with one broken. And then this has been developed by degree from bits of scrap metal I had lying around. The way it functions is you slot together these angle uh, pieces which fit inside which came from the skirting in the front room. Someone had used these, so just bits of scrap steel, basically a piece of copper wire in the middle there to link them together, and then they sit on top like that. And obviously you just burn the fuel inside. And it works very effectively, as you can see here.
So that's my little improvised stove that I'm taking with me, just enough to heat up a little mug of water for a brew. Well, a little mug, it's a pint mug, so it's, it's not that small, but uh, just uh, as long as I don't lose the bits, it all clips together quite nicely and packs down inside itself, including some of the fuel. I'm carrying a little bit of extra fuel as well. But uh, the, these three blocks fit inside quite nicely. Put them in there, and then the broken one, which just slots in at the end there, if I can get them all to slot in neatly. There we go. And then just wraps up in grease proof inside. So keeps it nice and uh, nice and neat in there. So that's that's that. Some spare hexy here again wrapped in in grease proof as well. So plenty of fuel and stuff to be going out there. That may well get moved to the haversack when we when we arrive. Ration bag which rations will be provided when we get there. So a ration bag to carry the rations, packed in here for now, for, for transit. And then my own snack I'm taking with me is a bar of Kendall mint cake. Of course, not to be com confused with the Hexy because it does look quite similar. Uh, Kendall mint cake, for those who don't know, um, it, the perhaps US, people viewing in the US, I don't know if you find it over there. It's uh, basically a sugar cake uh, flavored with mint. Uh, it's a very good energy snack. It was around at the time. It's used on various expeditions and things as a high energy food stuff. Uh, and it's a bit like, um, I guess, the mint centers you get in some chocolates and things like that, but a little bit harder. You can get it coated in chocolate, but this is just plain white uh, in a period label. So I've repacked it in a, a, a Hadwin's uh, Kendall Mint Cake uh, wrapper there, which is from Tommy's Pack Fillers. I did enlarge this slightly to fit over a, a larger block of, of Kendall Mint Cake. So that's my what, main piece of rations I'm taking with me there to snack on. Have half of that each day. Uh, keep me going. Obviously very high energy. And then obviously we have the repro mess tins here. These are from Soldier of Fortune uh, in, a, in a repro cover from Military History Workshop. So that's my, uh, my mess tins and cover. And as I say, what I've got packed in them for the minute, which is for while I'm in transit. Once we get there, there may be some repacking to fit in various other items and, and carry things more effectively once I have a slightly heavier load. But for the minute, everything packed quite neatly in there. That's the mess tins and contents. We'll have a look at the rest of the pack contents now. So underneath the flap of the pack here, we have the ground sheet. This is a Mark VI ground sheet, a reproduction. Again, I, I think from Soldier of Fortune. Unfortunately, the finish is not quite right. It's more of a Macintosh finish, similar to the second version of the Mark VII ground sheet that was introduced during the Second World War. It should really be a rubberized finish in a, in a brownish green sludgy color, I guess you could say. So I'm going to look at improving this going forward, hopefully, and put a different finish on it. We'll get it out anyway and have a quick look at it. And obviously the rest of the, the pack contents as well. Unbuckle this here. A little bit awkward working around the tripod. There we go. Let's take this out. You can see it does have the, the metal eyelets around the edges. It should do, and it is the correct size. Uh, it is a rubberized finish, so hopefully, as I say, sort of Macintosh finish, it'll be of use. Not absolutely correct, as I say, in, in the terms of manufacturer, looking at original examples, but it will serve its purpose anyway. So that's the uh, the ground sheet there. Then underneath the flap here, we have, the first thing is on top is a cardigan. This is just a modern brown cardigan, and it is a pure wool. Uh, it's not a period knit example, so I, that is something, again, I want to replace in the future. But for wear at night, that's going to be a very useful thing to have. And it is similar to the patterns that were worn at the time. As I say, it's something I intend to improve on going forward, is that is to get a, a more accurate period cardigan. And the main bulk of what's in the pack then is just the blanket, which is exactly the same as the one the kit's been laid out on here. It's a grey army blanket, uh, wool blanket. So... Again, uh, we're not taking our packs into the line with us, uh, so it's only if it's very cold at night that we'll be uh, recourse to this. It would be a great coat if I had one, but I don't have one. I don't have a single-breasted great coat myself. So again, that's something to look into in the future. I might well purchase one to improve my kit from that point of view, uh, but for the moment, I've got this, this wool blanket with me. Another creature comfort, which I have, is a, in this stoneware bottle. It's a bottle of Vimto. Uh, now this is a cordial, fruit cordial, uh, which was introduced in 1908. And I've managed to get a fairly good reproduction of what they looked like at the time. I believe the stoneware bottles that came in were a little bit smaller, although they, they may have been in, in various sizes. The label is an original from the period, oh, sorry, the label is copied off an original from the periods. It's not made up, it is 
how Vimto labels were at the time. And you just add water, but you add to water basically. So it's very nice, hot, uh, a cold night. So again, it's something that I can share around with the lads. The idea of this is not necessarily something I'd have been carrying with me for a long time or really been carrying with me at all. It's something that would have been sent to me in the line previously in a, in a package and I still have hold of uh, in it, say it would have been carried in the line probably and used and then the bottle discarded. Uh, but obviously uh, carrying it with me is necessary to get, get it into the trench in the first place. So I've just stowed it in the pack. But in, in my thinking, it's something that would have been delivered to me whilst I was in the trench. And as I say, wouldn't necessarily be carried with you. It's quite heavy in a stoneware bottle, uh, but you know, it's the kind of thing that would be consumed and then the bottle just disposed of. Uh, but it'd be a nice little creature comfort to have. It's very easy. You just add to, you know, add water basically, or add to water to flavor the water. So uh, it'll be uh, it'll be a nice thing to have. And as I say, easy to share around as well. Uh, if uh, Hopefully it'll be uh, uh, something that other people partake of as well. And just a little bit of extra creature comfort there. So bottle of Vimto. And a final thing to mention here, I am of course taking a rifle sling. Uh, I'm being issued a rifle there, but I need to take my own sling. So that's the last bit of kit I'm taking with me. The last bit of web equipment is a, a rifle sling. So uh, that is a look through the, the kit for the 48 hour trench event. And the next bit of this video will be filmed after I get back and I'll let you know how it went and how we got on. Right, so I'm back from what I have to say was a very interesting weekend. Uh, the scenario involved Hawthorne Trench down in Kent, which is a copy of a trench actually laid out on an existing trench map. So it was very interesting from that point of view is it's a recreated section of trench which we know actually existed in France during the Great War. The soil there is very chalky and the weather was dry, so it was a very dry trench that we were in. Uh, the actual strata is the same band of chalk that runs right the way through across and over onto the Somme uh, through the White Cliffs of Dover essentially. So it's actually the same strata, it's the same rock uh, that you find over on the Somme in the chalky areas of the Somme. The trench was uh, quite well organised. We, we did have a cookhouse, uh, we had a, uh, an officer's dugout, obviously the front line and then the reserve lines to the rear. We rotated through these. On the first night we, we entered the trench around dusk to, in theory, have replaced obviously the existing battalion who were occupying that section of trench. We had three sections. We had a Lewis gun section and two sections of riflemen. I was the Lance Corporal in one section, as I've said already. And we were the first ones to occupy the front line, although obviously all three sections went in on initially taking over the trench. There was a, a brief firefight with the Germans who realised something was going on. And then uh, we stood we, we stood two uh, through until darkness. Uh, and then two section went to the rear, leaving one section. And I think the Lewis section stayed with us as well, if I remember correctly, manning the trench for a two hour stint. We then rotated through with two section replacing us and we went back. And at that point we, we settled down, we had something to eat, uh, tried to make a brew. Uh, I had some of my Vimto, hot Vimto. Uh, and then two hours came around again, we re-replaced re two section and then rotated again two hours later and got back and tried to get some kip. Just lay out a ground sheet on the, on the deck and got some warmer clothing on by this point and tried to sleep, a short amount of sleep. And as I remember, we then, uh, we were called forward to do a reconnaissance uh, and Corporal Blythe and myself uh, crawled forward into the area between the two trenches, no man's land, to try and ascertain the lay of the land out in front of our front line. It was very difficult to do this in, in the dark. The, it was very high contrast because the chalk, particularly where it had been churned up, uh, was very white, of course, and, and the other features were very much black blobs against this. So we did find two shell craters out ahead of our line, a very large one right in the centre. And beyond that, it, would, it turned out later on, of course, there were other shell holes, but these two were what we found, and we, we thought we'd then found the German line just ahead of this. And it was very difficult. It, it, obviously, you're not operating under the actual tension that you, there would have been. It's very much a simulated scenario, so you know there's no chance of you actually coming to, coming to harm unless you do something very stupid. But nevertheless, we were trying to obviously act in a way or lean into the role we were trying to portray and the scenario we were trying to portray. And it is very difficult to move around quietly, uh, particularly when there's loose rock and so forth lying around and you, you can disturb things. Uh, but trying to get down into the shell holes or get over the lip of these shell holes as quickly as possible, project presenting no target or as little target as possible. It was all very interesting trying to do that in the, in the best way possible, according to what was done at the time. And again, trying to stay true to the tactics and so forth that we used at the time and the, the methods used for these sort of reconnaissances. 
We then pulled back to our own line. We had a sap brewing forward on our right flank, and this is what we used to enter and exit the trench. Uh, we then, uh, Corporal Blythe then um, stood to with the rest of one section. I was allowed to get some kip. And then I, uh, when they went on, stag again, obviously I went on, uh, they, they, when they came off again, uh, I went and made myself busy having got a little bit more sleep and went and helped uh, distributing, uh, took a, a, a Dixie full of tea up to two section when they were on the front line and uh, then went back and tried to get a little bit more sleep. And that was the first night. We then had a relatively busy day the second day and the Germans were quite active. So we had several different scenarios there of trying to uh, keep their heads down and prevent them from, from being as aggressive as they, as they wanted to be. It was supposed to be a relatively quiet section of trench, but it proved not to be. It was quite active while we were there. Uh, gas attacks, we uh, had to uh, don our pH respirators on several occasions. And these obviously aren't actually wet with phenate hexamine as they would have been. They would have actually been damp, essentially wearing a damp bag on your head. Uh, they weren't, they were dry. We, we don't tend to soak them in anything. But nevertheless, very uncomfortable to wear uh, and difficult to keep the eye pieces clean and, and clear when you're wearing them. They fog up very, very easily. So that was interesting, trying to keep your vision clear and trying to, to carry out your, your duties wearing one of these uh, was quite difficult. That was an interesting experience. Uh, from my own point of view, the experience, the things I took away from the, the first night was that the, the trench guard basically prevented me from reading my wristwatch, so that got removed, so that I could actually tell what time it was. Uh, it doesn't have any loom on the face, my wristwatch, which probably would have helped matters, but it was under my cuff, uh, under the cuff of my jacket most of the time anyway, so it wouldn't have had time to recharge, so the, the trench guard came off, so I could actually read it. Certainly, I was very pleased that I did choose to wear the woolen drawers that I took with me, that certainly helped matters at night when it got colder, another layer of wool, wool against the skin, always good. Uh, so that was something I was glad I did. On the second night, there was also a trench raid with men going forward to try and recover a prisoner. And that was successfully conducted. And we used a distraction on the on the, our right flank so that the, the trench raiding party could exit on our left flank to go and obviously raid the German lines. We used a distraction with the Lewis gun firing from our sap, which ran out on the right flank, uh, up to a large shell hole, and several men went forward into the shell hole and fired from a forward position there, and also used a dummy to try and confuse the Germans as to what exactly was going on, and to lead them to believe that the raid was perhaps carried, being carried on from the right flank, when in fact men were uh, exiting the trench and, and entering their trench on the Germans' right flank, our left. And that worked very effectively, although we did take a casualty during that, obviously simulated casualty, uh, just of course necessary to distinguish that because of accidents and so forth moving around in the dark, people can hurt themselves. Uh, a simulated casualty uh, of the Germans uh, firing, um, and that meant the stretcher, bear stretcher bearers had something to do as well. Uh, but a prisoner was successfully recovered, and information was gathered from him, who was taken down to the officer's dugout and interrogated. Again, another interesting scenario to be involved with. Uh, one section were primarily involved with providing the distraction on the far right of our flank, uh, firing at the Germans, and obviously uh, a party drawn from one section were involved in the forward sap and the shell hole to our front with the dummy and the along with part of the Lewis section firing from that position. Very interesting indeed to be involved with that and as I say based at least to a degree on the tactics that were used at the time. The second day uh, we had a relatively limited uh, scope of things we could do. The uh, landowner came up and asked us not to fire after 10.30 if I remember correctly so that was a bit of a shame and that really put a dampener on the second day. Nevertheless in the morning we had uh, we had uh, stood to we, we would inform that would be uh, going over the top and occupying the German line that then got cancelled. However, the Germans decided to come forward and raid our trench, and we had to drive them off, which was interesting. Again, using the the tactics that we used at the time, and again, all an interesting learning experience. Something that I've not really been involved with in living history, certainly not the Great War side of things. So that was, as I say, very interesting indeed. In regards my own little things I'd wondered about, I didn't end up using the straight yet razor. Indeed, I didn't end up shaving at all. There really wasn't time. We were very, very busy. So between snatching sleep and carrying out other duties in the trench, as well as manning the front line, uh, there wasn't really time to shave. And this is not uncommon. It's not uncommon in, in period accounts to read of men not being able to shave, both through lack of water and simply when a, when a front line was very active. Uh, it was often not possible. We were often called to stand to when we weren't actually manning the front line and had to move up quickly from the reserve lines to, to add to uh, 
uh, number two section is firepower, and that happened in the morning on a, a couple, on the second day. Uh, we were we were called up to the front line before we'd had chance to ablute or anything like that. I had planned to shave, but it just it, there wasn't time at that point. So. That's a brief rundown of what we got up to. Uh, if you'd like to see something a little bit more lighthearted and you've got this far in the video, watch through to the end of the end credits and you'll see there's a little bit of extra amusement added in there that uh, one of the other attendees, I think Steve Davis, one of the, the organisers of it, filmed for me. So thank you very much for passing over the footage, Steve. Uh, it was, as I say, overall a very enjoyable experience, very interesting experience, although I was very happy to get back to my own bed. Uh, and I say doing it for two days was enough for me. I do not envy the men who had to go and live under those conditions. And as I say, we were in a relatively dry trench uh, in dry weather. For those who had to stick it through the winter months, I do not envy them at all. In, in amazing endurance just to live in the conditions. And as I say, particularly in wetter areas and clay areas over in France where the trenches were not as comfortable as ours was. Uh, yes, it, it, but nevertheless, an interesting little snapshot, and I've certainly taken quite a lot away from it. And I'm looking forward to the next one, which I think is going to be 1918, and actually um, one of the periods of the short periods of a war of movement during the Great War. I think the the Hundred Days Offensive is the, the intention uh, to recreate a, a, a part of that. So it will be a very different scenario next time. Obviously, some change to kit and equipment as well. It'll be interesting to see what we get up to there, and I'll let you more, know more about that nearer the time. Uh, I'm hoping it might be possible to film a little bit more at the next one. Uh, I might be able to organise that. We shall see. Uh, as I say, I'd like to do that because just running through it in this way is obviously not as interesting as actually having some footage from the scenario itself. I hope you've enjoyed watching this nevertheless. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell down below, the little notification button, and that will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, guys. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. If you don't really use social media, you can nevertheless get in touch. There is an email address down there as well. That's not quite everything for this video, but I'll leave you with a little bit of humour after the end of the credits. Bye for now. So, on Mannequin of the Month this month, we're looking at this monstrosity. Uh, this is uh, Corporal Comeuppance, I think that's your name? Yes. There we go, <laughs> Corporal Comeuppance. Uh, it's starting as the top as we normally do. We have here a Mark I steel helmet inside a, a drill cover. You can see the cap badge here of the Ox and Bucks Light Infantry. And then this abomination is a sandbag, which has been stuffed with... What's it been stuffed with? A great coat. A great coat. And then chalk applied to make a very realistic face, as we can see there. Uh, this is obviously a dummy uh, for use in hopefully confusing the Germans. Whether they'll be deceived, I very much doubt, but hopefully it'll be confusing to them. We then have a service dress jacket here, as you can see, Corporal's insignia, and we have here embroidered Oxen Bucks titles. So yeah, that's uh, Mannequin of the Month for this month. Uh, yes, it certainly frightens the hell out of me and hopefully it'll frighten the hell out of the Germans as well.